Welcome to Fairview, Pennsylvania. Situated along the southern shores of Lake Erie, this wonderful lakeside township is filled with rich history and local pride. Join us as residents show and tell everything that makes their community a great hometown. My name is Denise Clear Krayinski, and I'm going to talk about how Fairview Township transitioned from an agricultural community to a suburban community during the years of 1960 through 1990, which happened to be the years that my dad was township supervisor of Fairview for those years. Previous to him in the late 50s, uh, a group of supervisors and the planning commission developed a report or asked to have a report about the projection of the future of Fairview Township. And as a result of that comprehensive plan, which was published in 1960, uh, Fairview Township was projected to being an agricultural community to a, more of a suburban community. And that was projected for about 20 years down the road. And so my father became supervisor in 1960. He did study it and thought that, you know, this has a lot of good points for the regular development, steady development, organized development of Fairview Township. And if they would pick up on some of the key points of this comprehensive plan, he could see how so the suburbs of Fairview Township would be very, very well organized. Uh, Mr. Kenneth Trout became uh, a supervisor of Fairview in 1961. He happened to be a boyhood friend of my dad's and they had adjacent farms. And so they worked together as supervisors of Fairview Township for the next 29 years. First key component of that comprehensive plan was to build a new township hall and garage. So that was the first goal of the township supervisors at the time, along with Mr. Glenn Duncan, who was a treasurer secretary of the township, uh, they got the funding for it eventually in 1963, and they built that new building on McCray Road in 98, and that happened in 1963. So that was one of the first goals that they implemented. The second component goal that they were working for was an orderly development of the land use, subdivisions, and industry and agriculture. And there was a projection of population growth in the next 20 years, and they needed to have more housing. Because of that population projection, they decided to develop zoning laws, housing develop, subdivision zoning laws to facilitate an orderly housing development. And so as a subsequent to that, Walnut Heights came into being, Bridalwood came into being, uh, some other Whitehall Village came into existence, and also a new concept came on the horizon, condominium living. That was a new type of living that nobody ever heard about but Fairview Township was one of the first ones to develop a country club estates. And so that's how the goals of the housing development came into being during those years. Another aspect of the comprehensive plan was to get all those country roads paved. Uh, my dad was also, besides being very interested in zoning and planning, he was also very interested in, in getting more industry into the township. And he felt that it would provide a more solid tax base and also employment. And uh, subsequently throughout the years, 
that he was township supervisor. Uh, businesses, little businesses sprung up along Route 20. Well, while he was township supervisor, he uh, was also a member of the Erie County uh, Metropolitan Planning Commission. For 20 years, he served on it with various public county officials. And when he retired, uh, Judy Lynch at the time uh, sent him a citation expressing her gratitude for with him working with her and other folks to do some planning for the Erie County in general. And he did retire and a few years afterwards, he was asked to chair the consolidation committee for the merger of the borough and Fairview Township. But while he was working on it, groundbreaking was ceremony was transpiring. And at that point for a new business park, Fairview Business Park, which is adjacent to I-90 and 98, and it was announced at that ceremony that the drive throughout that business park was going to be named Clear Drive. Well, I, I would just like to say that my father was a public official that was serving the community. He always viewed himself as serving the community, looking for the greater good of the community, along with his fellow supervisor, Ken Trout, who unfortunately was not able to see the, the fruits of their labors because he passed away in 1991. And, uh, they all got along well together. They kept their eye on the goal. Uh, were there instances where people did not like what they were doing? I'm sure there were. That's a function of being in public office. But all in all, uh, he felt pretty, pretty comfortable with what he was doing. And he always continued to farm too. So that there was a dichotomy moving forward to suburban, but still, you know, participating as a farmer also. I'm Barb Parchi. I was privileged to be Secretary Treasurer for Fairview Township for 28 years. And during that time, there were many projects, but two projects that I'm, uh, are dear to my heart are the consolidation of Fairview Township and Fairview Borough, and the one is the acquisition of this property that we're sitting in, uh, Avonia Beach Park. Prior to January of 1998, Fairview Township looked, or Fairview looked different because it was governed by two local governments. There was Fairview Borough that was the downtown area of Fairview. It had a population of about 1,700, kind of in the area of Route 20 and Route 98. And they were governed by an elected mayor and elected council, borough council. And they were totally surrounded by Fairview Township. So Fairview Township encapsulated them. Fairview Township had a population of around 78 to 7,900 people. And they are governed by uh, a board of supervisors, three elected supervisors. So in the 1990s, the two municipalities started talking, officials started talking about consolidation of services. And they agreed then that they would want to do a feasibility study. So they con so they contacted the Pennsylvania Economy League that helped to organize and construct a, a program for them to follow to have this accomplished. So the task force studied, did their feasibility study from November of 92 through June of 94. And it came down to the task force then had two votes to take. One, was it in the best interest of the community to form one municipality and they voted on that and it was a unanimous yes and it should be a township. The second vote was how do we accomplish this and they had a choice of a merger. The second was a consolidation which was a lot more involved and that's where both the borough and the township would cease to exist the end of December of 1997 and a new Fairview Township was formed to start in January of 1998. They voted 
There was a split vote and the majority voted for consolidation. So the task force then proceeded with the necessary petitions to get the question on the val ballot because both the borough and the township voters would vote on this and it would have to be passed by a majority of both. November of 1994, the question was voted on and it was passed by a majority of both borough and the township. This was about the second time anything like this had happened in the state of Pennsylvania. So January of 1998, after the dissolving of Fairview Borough and Fairview Township at the end of December of 97, the new Fairview Township took over. And um, there's a, an, a required organization meeting, and that's when the, the new supervisors took their oath of office and new appointments to boards, and that all took place. And they even went, had gone, been so efficient that they had new ordinances and comprehensive plans done so we went in with a brand new slate of everything it was above and beyond what we were really required to do but we were recognized for the accomplishments by the then government uh, governor tom ridge uh, he uh, nominated us for a 1998 uh, excellence in local government award and we received commendations and accolades from the senator jane earl and different uh, organizations for the effort that was put forth. And one of the, it's been a, a good, good thing to happen. Okay, another uh, wonderful project that happened was in 2006. And this was private property that became available for sale uh, to the township. It was the last known lakefront uh, access area to Lake Erie. Um, in the township. So they jumped at it and they had the cooperation of funding, helping to fund it through uh, DCNR, Coastal Zone Management, the Fish and Boat Commission, the Lake Erie Regency, Region Conservancy, and the Sons of Lake Erie. This, this acreage is right at the, at the mouth, uh, at the bottom of Avonia Road right at Lake Erie, right at the mouth of Trout Run, which is a pristine trout stream. And um, so it's, it's quite a, a, a gem to have uh, this accessibility. There was a real problem with, with no parking areas down here. So that was one of the th first things they did with the supervisors put in a big lighted uh, parking lot uh, they've gradually over the years developed it with pagodas that allows for family picnics and people are, have access to the beach and uh, the Brueger House um, is now open for rental by the Park and Recreation for all kinds of events. It's been made handicap accessible with a bathroom inside and outside access. And it's just a beautiful place to come when you come down Avonia Road towards the lake and you come across the last hill and you look out and see the beautiful spot that it is. And uh, of course, the view of the beautiful sunsets of, that we experience here in Lake Erie. So it's just been a real wonderful addition for the public and they really utilize it a lot for many different areas. I'm Nate Millett, I'm the director of Fairview Parks and Recreation Authority and just here to give you a little bit of insight of what we do for the community of Fairview. Fairview Parks and Rec was formed by um, back then the Fairview Borough, Fairview Township and the Fairview uh, School District. So members of those three entities kind of came together and decided there was a need for a, a recreational authority here in Fairview. And um, so that took place in 1980, and uh, we've been in existence ever, that, ever since then. Number one thing is, is providing programs uh, for the township residents. And um, what's un unique about us is that we actually offer programs to anybody. Um, you don't have to be a Fairview resident to participate in our, our programs. Uh, you can be from anywhere um, to participate. So that is nice and there's no additional charge for, <clears throat> for a non-resident or anything like that. So we offer programs, sporting programs, uh, educational programs, nature programs, um, um, 
obviously recreational programming as well. So um, anything that provides that type of service for our residents, um, we're, we're trying to expand on, on those programs. Yeah, so we actually host a number of community events uh, throughout the year, um, one of which is Winter Fun Day. Um, in the middle of winter, uh, we, and that takes place at Pleasant Ridge Park. Uh, they're open and free to anybody to participate. And, uh, you know, it's just a great way to enjoy the park, especially in the wintertime, because not many people venture out there in the wintertime. Uh, another one is in the summer. We call it Movies at the Ridge. Those are three movies that we play on the lawn at Pleasant Ridge Park. Uh, they're family friendly. We have food trucks that come out. Uh, different activities uh, before the movie actually starts and then at dusk everybody sits down on the lawn and enjoys an outdoor movie. Um, and then another one that we have is uh, Fairview Fall Fest. Uh, it used to be called Pumpkin Launch but we did change the name of it um, here in 2019 to Fairview Fall Fest. Um, expanded it to have trick-or-treating costume contests. We have a pumpkin launch that goes on um, where the pumpkins get smashed in the lawn. Food trucks are available. And it's probably one of our more, more popular events in the community. But, you know, the idea for these community events is to bring the community together, enjoy our outdoor spaces, enjoy the fact that you're a Fairview resident or live in this general area of Erie County and get together and, uh, like I said, enjoy the outdoor spaces that we have. Yeah, so we, we offer two rental facilities. One is called the Brugger House at Avonia Beach, which is a beautiful setting um, right on the lake shore of Lake Erie. I mean, it's perfect for weddings, it's perfect for uh, rehearsal dinners, we've had graduation parties there. Uh, our second one is called Pleasant Ridge Park, and if you think of like a, a, you know, a, a recreational pavilion, that's, that's what it is. The nice thing about Pleasant Ridge Park and the pavilion there is it is enclosed, and you can actually open it or close it depending on the weather or the time of the year. Yeah, so we have a number of public parks in Fairview Township, um, Avonia Beach and Pleasant Ridge Park. Obviously, so um, Pleasant Ridge Park is 86 acres. It has a mixture of uh, trails that go through um, mature forest, hemlock forest. It's really a beautiful park, and I think it's you know one of our hidden gems of Erie County, to be honest with you, that not too many people know about. Um, and then we have Avonia Beach as well. So uh, fishing takes place there. Um, there's trout run that flows right in here, so you can actually see the steelhead coming in. And, and get to check them out trying to jump over the waterfalls. Um, plus you have the Brugger House and just the beautiful setting of, of a park being right on, on Lake Erie. Um, we have Flag Park, which I'm sure not a lot of people know about Flag Park. It's actually right in the middle of the Fairview Industrial Park. Um, we also have the Struchan Flats, which is right on um, Elk Creek. Um, more than anything, the steelhead fishermen use, use uh, Struchan Flats. So. Uh, it's a great park that's owned by the township as well, 13 acres, there's some trails through there, um, but for the most part, it is a fisherman's paradise down there, so the steelhead fishermen use that um, during the fall, winter, and spring months. Um, and then we have Central Park, which I'm sure a lot of people drive by Central Park and don't even realize that it's a park. It's right downtown Fairview, right on the intersection of Route 20 and Route 98. Uh, there's the the Fairview sign there and that's actually an official um, community park of ours. Honestly, as a, as a Parks and Rec authority, I think it's important that we provide a service, a recreational service to not only the township residents but to anybody that lives in, in the area or the region. Uh, just because enjoying your outdoor spaces is a part of enjoying where you live. And so having these opportunities for folks is important. Uh, to us and uh, you know make that happen and, and have those folks enjoy the recreational and the outdoor spaces that we do have because we do have some very beautiful outdoor recreational spaces. My name is Austin Thomas Tudup. I lived in Fairview for my whole life. My favorite thing about our town is the fishing. I love fishing because um, it's really fun. I like to go fishing at the gravel pit ponds. Um, and I like to go with my family, like my mom and my dad and my brothers and my uncle and my pa. Um, one time when I went there, I caught eight 
big um, trout. And um, how I caught that big trout is by using a can of corn. I love trout raw and, um, because on my because there's tons of steelhead there when they jump. And tons of people um, from long ways, they come here just to see the fish jump. I go once a year. Um, and it's kind of like a family tradition because it's really fun. When it's ice and cold, cold I, get, I can go ice fishing. And it's really fun because one, um, my dad and me like to go ice fishing, and one time we got lots of fish th ice fishing. Hi, my name is Michael Gallagher, and I'm president of the Fairview uh, Area Historical Society, and I'm gonna talk about the uh, Historical Society and our home, the, uh, the Sturgeon House, and what it means to the community. The Historical Society began um, shortly after the bicentennial of the United States in 1986, and um, a group of residents decided they wanted to learn more about the history of our region and also um, save historical pieces of our history for future use. So the society was formed um, right around that time. Shortly thereafter, um, they were looking at a home, a place to meet and a place for a home museum. And they settled on the Sturgeon House, which is located at Water Street and Avonia Road or Route 98, right at the corner. And the Sturgeon House was significant because it was built around 1838 by the Sturgeon family. And the area at that time was called Sturgeonville. Fairview was not a proper name of that region until about 1868. The Sturgeon family moved here, um, multiplied, uh, relatives came, and there were many, many Sturgeons in the area. So Sturgeonville was was our community at the time. So the home was actually, the Sturgeon House that I'm talking about, uh, was actually a, a federal style salt box type of home. It was a simple, uh, typical farmhouse of the day. So the Historical Society purchased that home for a home museum, but also a place to meet. They spent many years um, renovating the house and bringing it back to its original state, but really they didn't have to do as much as you would think because after the Sturgeon family moved out, after Robert and Sarah moved from that home, they rented it and it was rented for through four generations after them. So for five generations that home was rented. So not a lot of significant architectural changes happened to that home. So they really just had to replace rotten wood and change a little bit here and there, but the home was then settled in and a, um, a, a room was built off the back for meetings, but primarily the home was in, was in good shape for a, a museum house. They use it for four purposes. One is the museum home. It's furnished in uh, products or, or furniture from that time period and, and on. Uh, they're all donations to the home. Uh, we use it for education for many different um, projects to educate the public on what's happening or history or whatever is the interest of the day. But we've had other interesting things as well. We also use it at the Sturgeon House as a place for exhibits as well. And then the fourth thing that we use the home for is to collect genealogy. So families that, that uh, started here, left here, you know, came here, the genealogy is all on the second floor of that house and is available to people upon request to, to research families through our genealogy. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, I got interested in the, in the Historical Society based on the fact that I do have a, a slight liking for history, but I feel that, that history is important for all of us. It documents our past. It, um, you know, it's why do we study history so we don't make the same mistakes in the future. But it also is, is just plain interesting in the fact that, you know, there are before the homes existed in many places on all the corners in our town, something else may have existed then. Um, and it just is, it's very interesting. It just interests me. Uh, 
Hello, my name is Garth Hetz, and today I'd like to talk about Fairview Evergreen Nurseries, one of the oldest businesses in the Fairview community. Fairview Evergreen Nurseries is a large wholesale producer of ornamental nursery stock for the nursery trade. We sell to landscapers, landscape contractors, and particularly to re-wholesalers who buy our product and then resell it to, again, the landscape contractors, the garden centers, and the landscapers. Fairview Evergreen was founded in 1911 by my grandfather, Frank C. Hetz. Uh, Frank was born and raised on a small farm in Franklin Township out in southwestern Erie County. By the late 1890s, Frank was a successful house painter in, in the city of Erie. Uh, he had a, his own business, he was managing of several painters. In 1901, he married Mary Wagonman, and by 1909, by 1909 they had uh, four children between them, Mildred, Charles, Leroy, and Clifford. Uh, and Frank's health was deteriorating, and his, his doctor told him that he probably should find some other line of work because the lead in the paints of that time were probably affecting his health. And so he was on the lookout for something else to do. He'd been born and raised on a farm, so he, that's what he was thinking about. Christmas time, 1909, Frank and Mildred, his daughter, had gone to the, the old Erie Central Market to look for a Christmas tree. He found a nice spruce tree there, and when he counted the rings on the bottom of the tree found out that it was only eight years old. And the trees were selling for a dollar uh, or a little more. And Frank thought, if I had a couple of thousand of these to sell, I could make a really good living for my family. So his dream was born. He decided he was going to raise Christmas trees. Then all he needed to do was find some land out in the country where he could produce these trees. So he started growing seedlings in the backyard of his home on Raspberry Street. In the meantime, was able to borrow, for that time, a tremendous sum of $20,000, and he purchased 36 acres in Fairview on right along Water Street. Uh, it was right across the road from where the old Kanye Erie Traction Line used to run. So, in 1911, he finally, after he had worked long hours to get the land ready, in 1911, he was able to plant some of the first seedlings of the pine, spruce, and fir on that Fairview property. But the turning point, turning point for the entire operation was 19, end of 1917 and into 1918, when. Finally, his seedlings were, that he had planted in Fairview were ready to sell, and they started to sell them. They sold them not only uh, as Christmas trees, which he had anticipated, but they sold them as ornamental evergreens for people to put around their homes. It was the end of World War I. The veterans had come home. There was a housing boom, and people were looking for ornamental nursery stock to plant around their homes. So he did very well selling into that market. He did so well that by three years later, uh, 1921, he was able to purchase the best farm in Fairview, which was across the road from his, uh, from his original 36 acres. Uh, it was 72 acres, and at that time, it was considered to be the best farm in Fairview. So he was able to fairly rapidly expand the business by planting into that new acreage. By 1928, there were quite successful, and Frank formed a partnership with his four older children. And later, his, his younger, youngest son, Neil, who was born in 1917, would become a partner in the business also. In World War II, their workforce, which had been about 40 employees, was cut by about half because of the fact that the, the, the men went to either to serve in the armed forces or they went to work in the factories to support the war effort. So um, they decided at that point 
to sell more and more nursery stock wholesale and cut out the retail operation. And by 1944, they were selling wholesale only to people that were in the nursery trade to resell their product. Frank Hetz decided one time uh, in the, the late in 1940s, I guess, or maybe around 1950, I'm not sure of the exact date, but he tells the story. He retired, and his retirement lasted a half of a day. When he got home, and his wife Mary gave him a list of the things that he needed to accomplish, that same afternoon he was back out in his beloved seed beds, and he never retired again after that until the day that he died. In 1961, the remaining partners decided that they would incorporate Fairview Evergreen because there were third generation people such as myself who were interested in joining the business. In fact, at one point in time, after the business was incorporated in 1961, there were eight third generation shareholder employees. The, in the early 1960s, the interstate highway system was completed and the, uh, there was a Fairview exit on Interstate 90, so we were able then to access markets all the way to New York City and west, actually all the way to Kansas City. By the late 1990s, we had fourth generation people that wanted to become part of the business. So we had another reorganization, uh, 1999, 2000, and the fourth generation stepped into the management positions. And uh, the fourth generation are the people that are today managing the business. We like to say that Frank C. had saw his dream come true. Uh, he, he got to see it even before he died in 1954 but I think he would be very proud of the way uh, the business is, is managed and operated today by his, fourth gen by his fourth generation descendants and is still very successful selling only A1 plants to the, to the nursery trade. Hello, I'm Sabina Freeman. I'm going to talk today about the B'nai B'rith Home for Children. Um, children at the beginning of the last century were pretty much institutionalized when they were poor or orphaned. And uh, a, a, been a, a, an organization that was uh, benevolent, which was the B'nai B'rith, uh, wanted to put an orphanage in this area. It was in District 3 around the country. And so, with the help of Isidore Sobel of Erie, it happened. Um, there were temporary housing for the first children, there were about 20 of them, while the first building was being built. It was a boys' dorm completed in 1914. The girls' dorm was completed in 1916. They were pretty much mirror images, although they were built at right angles with a power plant between. There was a uh, study in each of them. The boys and girls were kept separate in most cases. Um, the children who were accepted were uh, no younger than five, uh, probably not older than 16 because children did not really go to school after 16. They quit school. A lot of them did. Uh, it was quite a nice campus. It was uh, along just west of the old borough line. It was north, immediately north of Route 20. Uh, there was a trolley that went right by it. There were uh, four railroad lines that went on the two tracks north of the property. And of course, it was close to the lake. So it was uh, an advantageous location. Uh, the children were uh, transported to Girard to the Battles Memorial School at first on the trolley because the Fairview School District in the borough had one building where all the children went from the borough and it was already crowded. When the falls came, they had a different philosophy. They wanted this to be a big home for children. Uh, they started, instead of calling it an orphanage, they called it the B'nai B'rith Home for Children. Uh, they said that the children, as long as they ate everything they fixed, had the right to go into a kitchen later 
and um, make themselves a peanut butter sandwich with day old bread uh, and a glass of milk. They were so well monitored that uh, the townspeople hardly knew they were there for, for a, quite a while until they actually started going to the Fairview School. This happened after the uh, Chestnut Building was open for high school. It was the joint borough and township uh, high school because at that time there were two school districts in Fairview. So when that happened, there was enough room for these children and they could walk to the school. Um, they uh, were encouraged to participate in sports and excel at scholastics. Um, if you would look in the yearbook to see all of the things that a graduating senior did in his uh, list of activities, I think you would find that most of these children did quite a bit. They just did everything they could, and they were encouraged to do that. Uh, and the gymnasium was built in 1927, and uh, with that, there was an apartment for the Fall family. Uh, Mr. Fall made sure there, that there were activities. They had a baseball team, and uh, they had the uh, uh, Boy Scouts, he had in the gymnasium, they would show uh, movies and invite, you could invite some of your friends in. Mrs. Fall died of cancer in 1949. By that time, uh, Jewish families were already aware of the Holocaust and what that had meant to them. And so they were already taking in extended family members. And uh, so the enrollment at the school fell, just dwindled away. Pappy Fall had encouraged them not to leave school at 16, but to go through and graduate. And uh, he was able to see those last few finish. The, the school closed um, completely by 1951. It was sold to a recreational area, which um, this company opened it one summer as a park. It failed and uh, closed up. The gymnasium was, uh, became a, a nursing home, the Fairview Manor, uh, and they got so many patients that they had to close it, and then it was used for storage, and then it was torn down. The girls' dorm burned down, so what remains is the boys' dormitory, the first building to be built, and it's now called the Town Terrace Inn. It's a restaurant and bar. Hello, I am Colleen Laceline. I own two businesses in Fairview, Greenland Drive-In and Chestnut Place Hallmark, previously known as The Little Store. Greenland opened in the year of 1955, uh, the summer of 1955, and it was uh, built on Route 20, and at that time Route 20 was a three-lane highway and it was shortly after Creamline was, was built that it did eventually turn into a four-lane highway. The, the original owners did live behind Creamland. They lived on Swanville Road, and behind their house was a, a pasture for horses, and they decided in, in the summer of 1955 to, to build an ice cream stand, and, and that's how Creamland came about. In the beginning, Creamland uh, dealt with a dairy out of Erie, and it was called Sunita Dairy. And basically, it just started out with, with ice cream cones, like all the, the, the simple things. Ice cream, cones, floats, sundaes. Uh, it wasn't too extravagant at that time. And then as Creamline, as Creamline grew, you know, the, the root beer floats came in, and all different flavors of floats, different flavors of ice cream, hard ice cream, that's a, that's a big thing now. Uh, Sugar-free ice creams, all these things are all what we sell presently. Yeah, it was, it was quite a few years ago. Uh, my husband and I bought Creamland in 1980, and uh, it was so, Shortly after we bought Creamland that he started the sign opening up in less than 90 days after the 1st of January. So the anticipation goes those three months of opening less than 90 days and then going down in 10 day increments 
uh, until opening day. But uh, I had a friend that wrote an article one time and she said the anticipation of Creamland opening on April 1st is like the impending uh, birth of a baby that you just can't wait until the event happens. And then, you know, everyone's so happy that, you know, that you're open for the season, just like a baby being born. It's, it's like a, a, a club, she also said in the article, and the only initiation fee to belong to this club is to buy an ice cream cone. But it's definitely a community place where people just love to meet and talk and people watch and just a general nice meeting place to enjoy your ice cream. Chestnut Place started in 1963. At that time, it was called The Little Store, and it started on Main Street, Fairview, and it was housed in a building that now holds Sabo's Pizza, and it was right next to Harold Weaver's old barber shop. And then in 1965, it moved into the corner of the main intersection of Fairview where um, Downey's Market was at the time. It, it was in the same building at, at that corner. And it started out just doing office supplies and stationery. And then in 1965, the uh, old uh, general store was demolished. It was called Rules General Store. And it was demolished and then the little store at that time that was the name of it um, was was built in 1965. We took it over my husband and I took it over in the summer of 1997 and it was called Chestnut Place Hallmark at that time and um, yeah we just kept the Hallmark name uh, you know, saw the beautiful cards at that time, got all kinds of nice gift items. And so th through both of our businesses, uh, we really appreciate the community of Fairview. Uh, they've supported both of our businesses, well, Creamland 64 years, Chestnut Place now 56 years. Uh, it wouldn't be without their support that we wouldn't have been in Fairview as long as we have. Um, I've always enjoyed helping the community in any way that I can support the Fairview and the Girard School Districts, uh, many of the churches, the Fairview and Girard Legions. Uh, so whatever I can do t to help out my community, uh, we go for it. Hi, my name is Mary Rennie. I'm here today to talk a little bit about the Lincoln Library in Fairview. Well, really there are two people who were probably most responsible for the branch libraries and for the Fairview Library, which is the Lincoln Community Library. And that is Dr. Raymond Blasco and then uh, James Spiegel, Jim Spiegel. Uh, Dr. Blasco left a large legacy to the library and he was instrumental in the construction of the Blasco Library, what became the Blasco Library down on the Bayfront. He also left a legacy for branch construction. And uh, at that time, Jim Spiegel was his executor. And Jim was one of those people who was able to take something and make it larger. It was like the loaves and fishes. And uh, he was the start of the Erie Regional Library Foundation, which became the vehicle for branch library development and construction. The branch actually started off, uh, branch design started off to be very conservative. It was patterned after the Iroquois branch library originally. And so you had a, a branch library that probably was less than 5,000 square feet, uh, maybe even smaller than that. and. Then we tapped into the community to say to them, what would you like to see in a branch? And of course, some of us had our own ideas and, uh, and the branch kept growing. And I would say Bob Mars in particular probably did at least a dozen 
different renderings of what the branch would look like. And each time it would grow a little more and a little more and a little more in terms of the parking. We, we had to have so many spaces in terms of the size of the community room because that was huge with the Fairview uh, community. They wanted a space and they made that clear to us. Um, a stage, uh, a coat closet. Um, but then we got the price tag <laughs> uh, of what it was. And I, and I think at that point we were well over 10,000 square feet of what the library would be. And so when we did get that price tag, then it became a matter of prioritizing. Okay, they want the community room. Do we really need a stage or can we make it a little more flexible? The story of the naming of the library is interesting in its own right. And uh, for, the, for a very long time, it had no name other than the Fairview Library, the working, working name of it. And then it was the Manchester Branch Library. In fact, our, our staff, for a long time, they were just calling it the Man Branch for short, the Man Branch. And, uh, but we had a significant donation and it was from Howard and Mary Lincoln. And um, as I remember it, they were uh, not particularly interested, I don't think, in having the branch named after them. I don't think they were looking for naming rights. I think what they wanted to do was to make a contribution locally that would make a difference in people's lives. But as I remember, uh, some of us who were working on the project pushed them a little bit and said, no, this is a significant donation. Maybe you would like to have the naming, a naming opportunity. And that's ultimately how it came about. But instead of calling it the Lincoln Library, which is what we had always assumed, um, Mary Lincoln came back to us and said, you know, I really want it to be called the Lincoln Community Center because this is so important to the community and to pull Fairview together and to have a space where it's about education, it's about socialization, it's about inspiration, it's about bringing people together in a spirit that makes it better for everyone. So um, we couldn't argue with her, uh, but we did go through some uh, uncertainties at the time because people would say to us, well, what happened to the library, you're a community center. So we, we had to work with it and, and do a little bit of educating. The library construction went on probably, it's I think for a good year. And um, the finishing of the inside, we, we really took our time with that branch in, in making sure that everything was just so and making sure that the finishes and the floor layout and so forth. So we opened in, I think it was May of 2009, and um, it, was, it was a big event. We had a ribbon cutting and the county executive was there at the time and the director of the library, Margaret Stewart. Um, I remember Howard and Mary Lincoln were there and the community was just out in full force uh, to see this library and it was shiny and brand new and just gave everyone the best feeling going through there and bringing their children and, and the what struck me I think was the progression of generations. Everyone from you know people well into their 90s all the way down to babies and, and they just filled the library. It was a great day. And it became one of the most heavily used libraries very quickly. I'm Dr. Katie Caterna, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Fairview Community Council. So the Fairview Community Council was formed in 1949 into 1950, looking for a doctor to come to the area because there hadn't been one for seven years. So the community thought that it was very important to get one, and so they were joining together to find one to come to the area. What is so awesome about this organization is that there's no motive behind it. It's just people coming together in a community to help other people in the community. And so we have the township supervisors that come and tell us what's going on in the township and the different things they're trying to get in and out of here. We have the churches that come that tell us the different group activities that they have going on or when their Christmas dinners are or when their Easter luncheons are. Or, and then you have the 
uh, school district. They actually, the superintendent comes and he tells us what's going on in the school district and what are things that we should be looking for and when they win their awards and those kind of things. And so it's just all these different organizations coming together to know and to help each other inside of Fairview. So when I was doing research for this, I was reading some of the different books that have wrote articles on it. And the Pennsylvania Gas Company, somebody came to check out the community council and he said that this is the most unique group he's ever ran into in any town. And I thought that is just so true. What's pretty amazing about the Fairview Community Council is even when it was formed back in 1949, it was for the betterment of the community. And that's something that we still stand firm on today, that we wanna help do things in the community that will help it. So different things that the Fairview Community Council does is that we give a scholarship to a high school senior every year. We have made the signs that say, welcome to Fairview. We have done the Busick Park Memorial. And every year we do a holiday food basket for local families that are in need that we have been able to help them with uh, dried food, perishable food. Uh, we give books to each of the kids under 18 and we give a toy to any of the kids under 13. And it's a lot of hands and luckily I'm very blessed with a lot of helpers. And so every uh, November we actually send out a letter to all of the businesses in the area asking for donations. We put it in the local West County News Journal for people that can send in monetary donations. The school district does a local food drive, so that's where we get our, perish our non-perishable foods. And then Walmart has really helped us that we buy our perishable foods through them. And then we organize it and we do all the packing on a Thursday night. And then we, do, we actually deliver it to these families on a Saturday morning. Uh, it is only in Fairview proper um, because it is the Fairview businesses in the Fairview community that's supporting it and so we want to make sure that the, the money is staying locally and every year it varies a little but on average we help about a hundred families. So the holiday food baskets are probably like my baby like I absolutely love doing it it's a lot of work but the reward that you get when you deliver the basket to a family who doesn't have what they want really helps out. I'm Naomi Faust and I'm a member of the Fairview Garden Club. I've been a member since 1997. I enjoy everything about it, the friendship, the gardens, it's just tremendous. In 1928, seven ladies from Fairview decided they needed a garden. So they formed a garden club and their mission was to stimulate interest in gardening and learn about gardening. And they, we began with 10 charter members. Today, our garden club has approximately 75 members, and we're a diverse group. Although most of us are retired because we have luncheon meetings, so women that are, continue to work are not able to join us. So the probably average age is 65 to 70, but we all have a love of gardening. But also, friendship is very, very important. Since I've joined, I have very, very many new friends in Fairview, and I love it. Well, we maintain four gardens. Uh, we, uh, we have the courtyard in Pleasant Ridge Manor. We have a garden at the Fairview Cemetery. We have a garden in Busick Park. That is that central area of our village. And we also maintain gardens in the post office. We water them, we deadhead them, we prune them. We just take care of them all summer. Uh, we have a committee that uh, chairs the entire and they make the selection. I would say most of them, probably all of them are perennials. I cannot mention because if I would go through, every garden's different, but we just try to have, well, we try to have as many native plants as we can because of course, as we all know, they are better to nurture and they do better in our climate. There's a Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Fairview Cemetery, and we plant and maintain a garden there. We also offer a scholarship to a Fairview student each year who is going to college and plans to uh, major in agriculture or horticulture or related field. We also each May go to Chestnut Hill School and, and help the second graders plant a Mother's Day plant for them. We have a silent auction each December and we uh, raise money and we donate this to the Pleasant Ridge Manor so they can buy Christmas presents for their needy guests. Uh, we have a Garden of the Month Award and uh, we go around, we have a committee that goes around and looks at everybody's garden. And each month we give them a nice little plaque to put in front and we take their picture and we put them in the paper. 
This has been going on for years. And also our most important function is probably our annual garden mart. We hold that each May and we raise quite a bit of money. We sell annuals and some nursery, nursery plants, but primarily we sell perennials that we dig up from our own garden. And this sustains us financially through the year. We, uh, all these mentioned that I mentioned, we, it supports those. And we also support local charities like the fire hall and things like that. It, every spring and fall, we uh, cover a two mile section of Bear Creek Road and we clean it. It's with the uh, state Adopt the Highway program. We've received quite a few citations and awards through the years, which we are very proud of. Probably the most or citation, most important citation that we received was in 1988. We served, uh, we started a recycling program, and we uh, met with members of Fairview, Gerard, Lake City, and we came up with a council of administration. And then we met uh, with some local providers who had trucks, and they brought the trucks into Cheston Hill School parking lot one Saturday a month and we went and volunteered and separated these, uh, these materials. And then we got an award from the state and that enabled us to have some more materials, buy some dumpsters and just get the program all, all, all running. And 10 years later, we received award from the, the uh, House of Representatives of Pennsylvania, which we are very proud. This is one of our most significant achievements. In 2006, we received the State Greening Award. We received an award for what, how we had transformed Busick Park. We planted flowers and we put benches in. And we're very, very happy because we got that from Keep Pennsylvania Beautiful. And Fairview is so beautiful along the lake. At one time, it was a rural farming community. And we're trying to keep the beauty of the, that community as it goes into a uh, suburban community. And this is one of our chief goals, also friendship. Friendship is so important, and we have all worked on all these projects and become good friends. Hi, I'm Lee Rose, commander at the Fairview American Legion, post 742. Um, I've been involved out there for almost 14 years now. Um, I'm here to discuss the parade that we put on every year. It's a community parade to honor our veterans. And it starts at the Holy Cross Church. They've been very nice about letting us stage the parade and start there. And it leaves the Holy Cross Church and runs across Route 20 to Maple Avenue. And then it turns right on Maple Avenue past the Legion down to the Fairview Cemetery. And then at the center of the Fairview Cemetery, we do a memorial ceremony that is put together to honor our veterans, present, past, and those becoming veterans. In the parade, there will be, of course, the Fairview Marching Band, um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, several community floats that people put in to let their clubs and organizations known. Anybody and everybody is welcome to contact us um, to put uh, floats uh, in the parade. We have antique cars. Um, the Fairview Legion riders always ride on their motorcycles during the parade. Um, the officers of the Legion are in cars, so everybody has a chance to see who they are, which would be the rider president, the post commander, the auxiliary commander, the SAL president, and the riders present are always in the parade. Um, pretty much anybody in the community is welcome to put any of their organization, um, ride, drive their cars. We have antique tractors, we have horses, I mean, it's just more for the community, and then it goes across 20, like I said earlier, and then down Maple Avenue, and then we have a ceremony for the veterans at the cemetery. There's a cannon every year that's fired during the parade. It's fired off five or six shots. In the past, I have always done it, but this year I'm gonna have to train someone to fire 
the cannon. Everybody's kind of happy about seeing the cannon. It is pretty loud and it is fun to fire. And it's fired several times during the parade and then it is fired down at the cemetery with the 21 gun salute. The parade usually we start planning it in early April, getting ready. There's a lot of work that goes into it. We all enjoy volunteering and putting our effort into making it something the community can remember throughout the year. Hi, my name is Matt Lane, and I'd like to talk about the Wall of Honor at Fairview High School. The Wall of Honor at Fairview High School is a dedicated space that we've chosen to set aside and recognize and honor the students at Fairview High School that have chosen to serve their country as part of their post-secondary plan when they leave Fairview. Um, we created the Wall of Honor because there's a lot of things that we do at Fairview High School to recognize our students and their accomplishments. Uh, we do a lot in terms of recognizing students uh, that perform well academically, uh, that perform well on the field of competition, uh, that perform well in a speech and debate tournament or, or in the marching band. But we recognized as well that there were a group of students that we were missing. Um, and we were missing a really important group of students, a group of students who ch are choosing to serve their country when they leave high school. And we felt that deserved recognition as well. As, as part of graduation at Fairview High School, all students note their post-secondary plan. So when students tell us that they plan to serve after graduation, we follow up with them uh, throughout the summer and into the fall. And when they complete uh, basic training or, or their version of basic training for whatever branch that they're in, they and their families communicate with us and they share with us their graduation picture from their service academy and we pair that on the wall of honor with their graduation photo from Fairview High School. We put them in a frame next to each other um, and then on the bottom of that frame it has the student's name and what branch of the service they've gone into. Those pictures hang on the wall of honor, honor underneath the uh, wall of honor sign and they rotate annually and are replaced each year by the students from the next graduating class that are choosing to serve. The Wall of Honor is in the main hallway of Fairview High School. Next to the Wall of Honor, we also have a space dedicated to Mike George, a Fairview graduate uh, who died during the Vietnam War. And in addition to dedicating this space, we also give a scholarship each year in his name. Last year, when we dedicated the Wall of Honor in its opening, we invited um, some representatives from the Fairview American Legion. Uh, they came and spoke about service and service to the community, and we invited members of the family as well. And it was the members of the family that hung the pictures on the wall um, of their students and children uh, that are serving. The Wall of Honor just seemed like a really natural fit for Fairview High School. You know, as I noted, we always pride ourselves in recognizing our students and our accomplishments. And the fact that we weren't recognizing our students that were making the biggest sacrifice, uh, not just for the school, but, but for their country, was something that you know, we were neglecting and, and really needed to do. Uh, so the Wall of Honor is really filling a void that had existed before in the building. Hi, I'm Deborah Foyle, and I'd like to talk to you today about the Fairview School Foundation. The foundation is a local nonprofit that supports teachers through many grants, um, issues scholarships to deserving seniors, and helps families in need. The foundation started in 1992 by uh, a local um, community member that had tremendous vision. Her name was Barbara Junker. Um, she was on the school board for 20 years, from 1977 to 1997, and started the foundation during her tenure there. One of the most important things the foundation does is award um, funds to the teachers in the form of mini grants that um, help them enhance their curriculum and reach beyond the parameters of the classroom. Um, an example of um, a mini grant would be um, the memory project. And what the memory project does is uh, to um, send digital and 
pictures of these children to our art teacher and our students, and then they do renderings that um, are sent back to the organization. The organization then travels to the part of the world where these children are affected and delivers these pictures to them. And part of this process is videoed and then comes back to our school. So the, the children that are receiving the pictures realize that they're valued and they're important. And the, because of the video, our students get to see the joy and the reward that they've created just through their artwork. It really is um, an amazing video to watch. Another um, area of mini grant that the foundation um, covers is the STEM opportunities for our students. And um, we, in all three of the schools on our campus, uh, we have created spaces in the libraries for this technology and the uh, kids can go in and work independently or collaboratively and create things. We, um, there are supplies available, we've got a cricket machine, just a lot of things that are very exciting for the children. We have created um, the high school created a technology area and the foundation supplied a laser engraver so that students have an opportunity to experience um, actual workforce um, environment as if they're on a manufacturing floor. Uh, we also did a sensory project for life skills students for all students in Erie County, they're part of the life skills program and it was a dance where these children could feel um, secure and comfortable in their environment. It was low lighting, it was music that had the bass altered, background noises altered so that the, um, the kids wouldn't feel overwhelmed. We cut our mini grants take care of all children, all ages, all abilities. It's not just for one niche of students. Um, we, we try to take care of all students and we, the more students we can take care of with a request, the happier we are about it. The, this year, we were involved in a request um, by our high school librarian and it's the Corner Cafe and what's exciting about that is that that uh, is run by our special needs students. So it gives them an opportunity to um, be entrepreneurial and again it's just a very exciting uh, concept that Fairview you know it, um, has in the schools and we're happy to be part of. Another area that the foundation is very proud of is our scholarship program. We have um, uh, 13 endowed scholarships and we also have um, 13 senior awards that we give out. We, we gave $18,000 last year to graduating seniors, which is a pretty impressive amount of money for uh, a smaller school district. The third area is the Student Support Fund, and that is an extremely important area because the demographics of Fairview have changed tremendously over the past several years, and people don't really realize that. The foundation helps uh, with food, with um, hygiene products, with, um, we recently had a student suffer a catastrophic loss and our community instantly, the day of, um, came forward with $4,000 and the foundation, you know, will supplement that and supply other things that this family may need. Uh, but our, our efforts to be supportive are, are very important to us. And we decided that we should probably begin a distinguished alumni program, which we've done in the last couple of years, and we have a tremendous team that's in charge of putting that together. Two of the past honorees have been Dr. David Utley and Pete Scobell was our most recent um, distinguished alumni. David Utley developed uh, a non-invasive technology um, to help with thyroid cancer that is still used in the, throughout the industry today, and that's a very important uh, discovery. And Pete Scobell is a veteran, a U.S. Navy SEAL, who has a list of accomplishments that are too long you know, for me to cover right now. We brought these men uh, not only to the community, but we brought them into the school to do assemblies for our kids so that they could see what these gentlemen have accomplished in the world 
and their path through Fairview and after Fairview, and it was very inspiring. The foundation is important because it, it, it combines with the community and the school district to enhance the well-being of our, the youth of today and our children and their success. And it's just, it's very important, not only to, it's the school district, the community, the foundation, it's a joint effort. And it's, um, it's it, in my mind, there's nothing more important than this commitment to our, our, our kids. My name is Jane, Jane Hess. I've taught at, uh, in kindergarten and Fairview Elementary for many years, most of my career. And I taught with a, a fellow teacher, Eileen Sanfilippo. The two of us were kindergarten teachers. I was a square type person and Eileen was a rebel type person. And we became good friends. And because we became good friends, at the time of her half century birthday, 50 years, I took upon myself to create a quilt for her from our staff. And each of the staff members were given a nine by nine inch piece of fabric. They were to decorate it any way they cared to decorate it, get it back to me, I would put it together and make a quilt for Eileen. It happened, it came to pass. And our principal at the time, Doug Weigel, made a, a square with the masks of happiness and sadness. Don Wilson made a square of numbers because Don always played the numbers. Mert Hinkle was our custodian at the time. And uh, he made a square of the tools of his trade, the brooms and the dustpan and et cetera. And uh, I'd have to mention uh, uh, Karen Askins, who at the time made Cabbage Patch dolls. And her square is, of course, a Cabbage Patch doll. Each square tells a little bit about the faculty at Chestnut Elementary in 1986 at the time. It was a wonderful faculty in that a good share of us, the principal share of us, all lived in Fairview. Our kids all went to Fairview schools, graduated from Fairview schools, and went on to do great things or not so great things, whatever the case may be. It was a privilege to make the quilt. We gave it to Eileen in April on her birthday. And uh, as happens with life, her life came to an end about maybe two months ago. And a friend of hers grabbed the quilt from her guest bedroom where she had always displayed it and brought it to me knowing that I would do whatever had to be done with the quilt because it becomes a historical register of sorts of our faculty in the elementary school at that time. It was a real joy to have made it and it's a joy to be able to talk about it and reminisce about the teachers I taught with. We're all retired now. Some are deceased, good many are deceased, but there's a bunch of us still out doing our thing. <laughs> uh, this quilt now will be given to the Historical Society um, at the Sturgeon House and just be kept as an artifact of the educational system of Fairview. I have shown it to Eric Kincaid, Dr. Eric Kincaid, our superintendent, and uh, he had hoped I would be giving it to the Historical Society. He uh, was really interested in what we did. And of course, nowadays, the faculty is spread out all over Erie County, probably, maybe beyond for as far as I know. So it, it will be with the Historical Society at Sturgeon House. Hi, I'm John Yonko, and today I'd like to talk to you about Camp Notre Dame. The Catholic Diocese of Erie purchased uh, the property, the 160-acre property from the Phillips family. It was a farm property, and they decided they wanted to start a children's camp. And so in 1960, the summer of 1960, Camp Notre Dame opened as an all-boys camp. 
We, we had room for 100 campers. Um, we had a horse barn that we converted into a dining hall, a chapel that used to be a chicken coop, and uh, 10 cabins that were newly built, uh, an old swimming pool that Camp Kateri, the local girls' day camp, uh, was nice enough to share with us in those early years. So the 1960s, uh, we slowly grew as uh, one, of the, one of the leading boys' camps in the, in the Erie area. And then in 1974, uh, we had girls' camping. Uh, so we would offer four weeks of all boys' camp and then three weeks of girls-only camp. And that was the first time we had female staff working with the guys at Camp Notre Dame. Uh, my wife started working in 1989 and she asked the question, why don't we have girls and boys at camp at the same time? So, uh, of course, one of our old timers said, well, we can't do that, uh, but we did it. And it was hugely popular and successful. And so in 1989, we started co-ed camping for boys and girls, a day camp program for four to eight year olds in 1991. And that's where we are today. Well, we're a traditional residential camp, a sleepaway camp. So kids come on Sunday with their sleeping bag and pillows, so their bug spray. Uh, we provide them meals. They get to go swimming. They have canoeing, fishing, archery, crafts, nature programs, a wilderness. Uh, we had a farm corral over the years, which is now our frontier program. Uh, so lots of outdoor, old-fashioned, fun activities. We've been providing camping to children and families for, for almost 60 years and uh, over 50,000 children have come to Camp Notre Dame and we've been able to provide them with an away from home experience, an unplugged experience. A, a big part of our mission and philosophy I think is for kids to just experience the outdoors uh, in a setting where there's no technology so they can get in touch with nature uh, really build uh, bonds and friendships with their fellow campers and just experience uh, really the glory of it, the beautiful piece of property that we enjoy in Fairview. So there's some apprehension, right? A kid coming to camp, not knowing everybody, maybe being away from home for the first time. And so getting to Friday, closing campfire is a really big deal. And kids who do that and who are a little nervous and, and you know, mom says, my child was crying on Sunday because he didn't want to leave me, and now he's crying on Friday because he doesn't want to leave camp. And that's that experience of, of an independent being away from home and, and that growth that a child will have by coming to any kind of a camp where they're uh, really learning some independence from, from home. You know, our staff, our college-age staff, every year we hire a new staff. Many of them return year after year. But there's bonding that happens, eight weeks living together uh, in the woods with children, uh, having fun, being crazy. And so uh, I can say from my experience as a young staff person in the 80s that uh, my best friends are the people that I met at Camp Notre Dame and that I got to work with. And my best friend of all is my wife. Uh, I met her there and we fell in love and we were, in, were married in 1991 and uh, our children are now going, you know, went to camp and now they're on staff as well. So it's really kind of, you know, it's been great being in Fairview for, for me for the last 40 years and uh, really excited about the, the future. And, you know, camp has a special niche in this community and we will continue to serve families and children and uh, celebrating 60 years next year. We're just really looking forward to, to that and uh, we have a lot to be grateful for. So in 1963, one of our staff uh, announced to the campers that he was going to swim to Canada. So he got a little American flag. Uh, they greased him up in Vaseline, and he swam out to lake, uh, out into the lake as far as he could till the kids couldn't see him anymore. Kids went to breakfast. He swam back to the shore. But he hid all day long. Uh, then at dinner time, after dinner, the kids went back to the shore. He was already out there with the Canadian flag, swimming back to the shoreline. He swam Lake Erie. He swam all the way to Canada. The campers never knew the secret, but that was one of the great stories from those early days of camp. Hi, I'm Joseph Preston, and today I'd like to talk to you about WLD Ranch. WLD Ranch is a camp. We have a summer camp and a variety of programs throughout the year. Uh, we are a Christian camp ministry with the mission of guiding campers and guests to Jesus as the truth in life. Uh, WLD Ranch is in the southern end of Fairview Township. 
and uh, we are tucked away in kind of the a remote part of the township. WLD Ranch is a, a Western themed camp, so we have uh, a lot of Western uh, style uh, facilities and we have horses and we have um, a rodeo during the summer camps, uh, but we do a variety of activities throughout the year. Uh, don't necessarily have to be a horse lover to come to the camp. So WLD Ranch started in 1963. It was named in memory of Wayne Leonard Davis. He was a young man who grew up in Fairview. He attended Fairview High School and in, uh, he graduated from Fairview in 1959. Uh, his family owned uh, some property where the camp is now, uh, but he and his dad would go there and uh, dream about having a place to be able to tell kids about Jesus. He was known in Fairview as the Rev, uh, you know, as Reverend, you know, he was known as a preacher. Um, he got kids together for Bible studies and um, his desire was to be a preacher. He went to college uh, to become a, a preacher, but he was killed in a car accident after two years of college. So he died in 1961 and uh, through the course of events, his parents decided to donate property, uh, donate the property, uh, 50 acres, to a church, Federated Church of East Springfield, uh, to start a camp in his memory. So. Uh, so the camp started in you know, the early 60s with uh, summer camps mainly, some winter weekend events, a um, couple events throughout the year, but really it was mainly a summer camp uh, for the first few years. They built a bunkhouse in the late 60s, added another one um, shortly after that, and just slowly started expanding the facilities on the property. And uh, in the 80s, uh, the programming really started to increase also. It went from just being uh, mainly summer camps to also having uh, weekend retreats. Uh, the horses uh, were always around so they were always an inviting, you know, people like to see horses so they would come and uh, ride the horses but then also in the 90s uh, Girl Scout program started where Girl Scouts would come for a weekend retreat just to focus on learning about horses. Uh, so the programs really have expanded from just summer camp to year-round uh, opportunities to come and enjoy life in a outdoor setting and uh, in a beautiful location. We also do a variety of uh, day programs. Uh, so it's not just, you know, there are overnight facilities for weekend retreats and summer camp, but we, we also have a lot of day programs that happen. Uh, we do a lot with school groups uh, doing team building. We have a uh, we have an extensive low element challenge course, so there are a variety of team building activities that can happen, uh, school groups and uh, youth groups and um, even adult groups will come out and um, work on being a team, and so that's a, a big emphasis that we have as well. In addition, we offer horse lessons uh, to anyone, any kids in the community in the fall and spring. We also have a program that we do with Shriners Hospital, um, helping kids with um, various uh, physical limitations uh, to ride horses. Camps are great places to pull away from a busy life and spend time out uh, away from hectic schedules and uh, so any opportunity people get to slow down and uh, come away to a location like WLD Ranch is uh, a great opportunity. Uh, of course with our Christian mission you know, we hope to see lives changed for Jesus uh, through the process of people coming and interacting with us. I'm Kimberly Denelko, and I'm the program director of Hope on Horseback, uh, which formerly was called Trek Therapeutic Riding Equestrian Center. And I was actually one of the founders, and I'm also one of the instructors and the equine manager, so I wear a lot of hats. <laughs> horseback riding is really amazing what it does for people with anybody. It, uh, just sitting on a horse helps your core strength, your balance, your posture. And then that as the horse starts walking, it does more. It, as anytime that wherever the horse is moving, it challenges your balance and your posture, and you're constantly working to, to sit properly. And uh, so, if people have a disability, it, it does even more for them. It helps them. And these the kids and adults that may not be able to participate in any sports and do anything uh, can be sitting on a horse and controlling the horse and 
really doing something and having fun at the same time. So they are working on their balance and all these things, even hand-eye coordination and even social skills. When, when they ride, there's a person leading the horse usually and, a, and our, we have volunteers on each side uh, supporting them as needed. So it helps them. So they're interacting with the horse, with their sidewalkers and with the other riders in a class. And we have people in wheelchairs. We have people at paraplegics ride. And we actually have a hydraulic lift. We can pick people right up out of their wheelchair and put them on the horse, which you would think that's amazing. And it is. And they're sitting up there riding and steering the horse and looking down on people instead of looking up out of their wheelchair. They're, they're higher and they're controlling something and they're having opportunities over and over again to have a success of doing something uh, you know, positive. We have a beautiful facility here in Fairview, which we're thrilled to have. It's probably one of the best uh, horse equestrian centers in the whole area. Uh, we have two huge big indoor arenas and outdoor arena and trails. We take our riders out on trails. It's Tailwind Equestrian Center on Saratania Road, and we've been there now for well, since like, I don't know, 30 some years. And we, we ourselves have 12 horses. Uh, there's probably 50 or 60 more horses on the facility. So it's a really beautiful place and well kept up. Um, we have uh, it's a beautiful, handicapped, accessible bathroom. You know, you wouldn't think you have a nice bathroom on a barn, but we do. And we have uh, a, a nice lounge and we have area for the parents can a heated area and it's, it's comfortable for them to watch their children ride. Um, that we're really lucky to have what we have. We have all different kind of horses and that's that's what's important. Uh, we're, we're, at, we're even looking for a couple more horses right now. Uh, but usually the older horses are more settled and, and calm, uh, but we're trying to get a horse under 20 right now. A lot of our horses, we even have a horse that's 31. And um, a couple of them, we have to train them especially to like to work with a hydraulic lift. We have a wheelchair ramp and they, it takes a little while to get horses get used to standing perfectly still for the ramp. And we have steps that we get on and off the horse with. Um, the horses have to be trained to get used to wheelchairs, balls, kids. We have a lot of autistic children that come, they, they may, the first time they get on, they might scream and yell and kick their feet. And the horses have to be trained. And they, they, the best horses know when they get, when a person gets on doing that, they're like, okay, when you're ready, I'll go. But when a, a skilled rider, we have, we have what we call equine conditioning team of volunteers that keep the horses in, uh, in shape in between and over the winter. And uh, when the skilled rider gets on, they know and they'll do everything they ask them to do carefully. So it's, it's amazing to see what the horses figure out and how good they are with these kids and adults. Uh, but we have some wonderful volunteers that, uh, we have volunteers that have been with us for 30 years uh, and you know 10 years, 12 years. And um, we have some that come for other programs like our veterans and then they come back and volunteer for the children and they love it. For years we've had programs for children and adults with mental and physical challenges and uh, we've actually started expanding our program. Um, so we have children with uh, cerebral palsy, mentally challenged, like I said, a lot of autistic children, blind, deaf, um, and, and paraplegics. Uh, but recently, in the last few years, we've added a program for veterans which we do not charge for veterans. Um, we, we got one grant for it and we're trying to get some more grants and donations are good to help that we, we, we think we trying to give back to our veterans. Um, and then our, uh, we've also added a program for crime victims or through the Crime Victim Center. We've collaborated with the Crime Victim Center and the Regional Cancer Center. So we have cancer survivors coming out and the crime victims coming out on a different day. And we also have a new program just a couple weeks started with from the uh, Mercy Center for Women coming out. It's not all riding either and it's hard to explain uh, because they start off with doing some groundwork with the horses and horses don't judge people. They, they, just, they just go by your body language and how you even feel that one day and you have to be authentic. They know when you're, when you're faking it. So these, these people are working with these horses on the ground and it's amazing to see what the, how it changes them and how they, they're telling us how they when they go home they feel calmer and they feel more trusting and they're realizing how what, you know what, how their feeling affects the people around them and uh, it, it's very hard to ex explain it without seeing it but it's really amazing and then most of them start riding also and they learn to ride and they're really enjoying that and then like I said a lot, a lot of them are coming back and volunteering also. Well, my favorite thing is uh, the actually low key, you know. I mean, we're not busy out here. There's no traffic out here. Uh, very low crime. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to live in Fairview. And uh, 
Like I say again, I'd like everybody to come out here and see what we have, not only on Route 20 and Route 5, but kind of sneak around a little bit and see what's going on. Um, I think my favorite thing about Fairview is just what it is. It's a unique community combined, made up of many different people, um, just the location along the lake, uh, easy access to, to the city of Erie, to uh, any, anything that you need to get to, it's easy access, but we're still out in the country. Uh, it's a lot like my hometown. I think uh, the people here are kind and uh, friendly. I've enjoyed meeting them. I'm not a native of Fairview, uh, but I've enjoyed learning their history. You know, I started coming out here when I was four years old. My mom said the best pumpkins in Erie County were grown in Fairview. So we used to come out to a little pumpkin farm every year. It seemed like a drive, a forever drive from Mill Creek back in those days. But, uh, but I remember fondly coming there. And then when I had the opportunity to work here in 1982, uh, it just seemed like a natural fit to come back to Fairview and, and give, uh, give a little bit of time. and. Uh, my life to the, the place that I love, Camp Critter Dame. Actually, what I love about Fairview is the Fairview Community Council because it's where I get to find out what's going on and what everything's happening and what we can do in, this, in the community. Well, to me, yes. To me, actually, my favorite thing about Fairview is Hope on Horseback, I have to be honest, uh, but, but I do enjoy the area. Uh, one of the things I enjoyed most about Fairview was being in the Fairview Marching Band. I still get excitement every fall because it's band season. It is one of my most favorite memories. Um, my favorite thing about Fairview is just, I've only lived in Fairview for 12 to 14 years and I've been very involved with the Legion and I've just been happy supporting our Legion and anybody is more than welcome to come and check the place out, and we'd love to have new members. So, I mentioned that I, I is my choice to, to move here. I've I always loved West County. I love the farms, I love the grapes, I love the smell of the grapes in the fall. I love the access to the lake that we have here uh, in many locations. The schools have been great for my children. Uh, it, it all, it's a, Fairview's a wonderful place to live. Well, I could, I could say everything. I love the small town atmosphere. I love being close to the lake. My husband and I, when, I was, when he was still alive, we would go fishing. I just love Fairview, and I'm planning to live here as long as I possibly can. What I love about Fairview is mostly just fishing. Uh, what I love about Fairview, I guess, is that I've been there all my life. I was actually born in a house on Water Street. When I first started to work at Fairview Evergreen, I worked in our office, which was on Water Street, which was actually in the old homestead that my grandfather had built. Uh, and when my wife and I decided to build a, a home of our own on Water Street still, it's near Bear Creek Road. So my wife always says to me, well, you know, you never really got any place. You were born on Water Street, you worked on Water Street, and now you live on Water Street. You've never gone any place but Fairview. And I guess that's what I love about Fairview. What I love about Fairview is it's a great place to live. It's uh, close enough to town to get to the places you need to be, but also um, it's a nice community in and of itself. I love Fairview because it is, it, it's a small community, it's a safe community, it's a great place to raise your kids, it's a great place to rely on your neighbor, it's, we have beautiful, uh, we have the lake. My kids all grew up and graduated from Fairview High. They were well educated. I think my favorite thing about Fairview is the educational system, um, which has produced all kinds of students. Um, since I was a part of it, of course, I'm partial. I've lived in a lot of states. I, I've worked in a lot of educational settings, and Fairview is just second to none. Um, I'm fortunate enough that I get to work with the most talented staff around, um, the most dedicated students that I know, and a family and community that values education. 
um, and what the school has to offer. I'm just really lucky. My favorite thing about Fairview is there's a lot of nice people there here and there's a lot of cooperative people here and it's just a nice community to live in. Well, I definitely have to say my favorite thing about Fairview is the people. It definitely is the people. Um, like I said, it, if I didn't have the support